Hey everybody, Ron Parlow and Dusty Hanshaw here. We want to give you some good news and say that um, a very helpful fan of the show, Casey Amendolero, did a whole bunch of work to reassemble the audio from the missing John Meadows interview. And he managed to put it together and save the show. We were unable to save the video, but we have the John Meadows interview and we're very happy to present it to you now. Of course, there's no ending. It just sort of ends abruptly, but uh, it's John Meadows at his best and Dusty and I having some fun. And uh, thanks a lot, John, for all the hassle because I know John was disappointed, but uh, now it's here. So thanks to Casey. Here's John Meadows. It's great to talk to you again, man. Um, I mean, you've been on the show before, very popular episodes. So you're one of the few people that we're doing the second episode with, you know, kind of going back, you know, as the show develops, you wind up with certain guests. You're like, we got to have that guy back on, you know, it is a must. It is a must. And so, uh, yeah, I, I thought, yeah, we got to get John back on for sure. There's been a lot going on the last, I guess, I don't know. Was it been a year since we had you on? Yeah, probably. It's been a while. Yeah. I mean, crazy times for everybody. How have you been? I've been good. Um, I'm just trying to keep up, but um, no, I've been good. My my kids have been keeping me busy, and um, I'm putting together all my playbooks for football, so that's been keeping me busy. And of course, you know, coaching and all that stuff. So yeah, busy. I actually wanted to start with football. <laughs> oh, don't get me started, man. No, I. That's where I wanted to start because I I know that's you're super hyped and excited about it. And and like, let's hear let's hear your football story. Like, did you play some football? I can't remember. Yeah, I did. Yeah, you I, played um, some. I did. You were a small I, kid, weren't you? Well, when I graduated from high school, I was about 170 pounds, but I was already squatting 500. So I was a strong yeah, yeah. kid. Yeah. But I was a fullback and a middle linebacker. And I just love football. I've always loved it. My first love for any sport for sports is not bodybuilding is football by, by a mile. Um, I just happen to be a lot better at bodybuilding than I was at football. So <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I played inside linebacker and guard. Okay. Well, that's an interesting yeah. combination. Yeah. I was one of the big kids, right? In the early nineties, not many kids were squatting 400 for reps and there weren't many kids in my school that were working out. So, you know, I was a six foot tall middle linebacker that weighed about 225. So for high school, I was a big kid, you know, Heck yeah, you're probably killing people. Oh yeah, and then when they when they asked me to play both ways because they needed a guard, I was like, oh, O line, okay, I'll help out. And then I realized O line was a vicious murderer position. It's yeah, there, there's <laughs> massive collisions, and I oh. assume you're probably pulling a little bit. So yeah, you're probably... I was doing all these traps and pulls, yeah. and you get to yep. ear hole guys that don't know you're coming, and yep. it was it was like it was. I realized like I thought as an inside linebacker, I was like. I'm the head hunter, right? You know? And then when I started playing guard, I was like, this is actually more sadistic. Yes, <laughs> for sure. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so what's, what happened? How did you wind up coaching? Well, um, so my kids started playing, uh, they're going into seventh grade now. They started playing going into would have been fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And, um, I really enjoyed watching them. They were on a good team. They had good coaches. So I first, first I should probably give you a little background here. I live in Pickerington, um, which is a suburb. Uh, I think you've probably been here, a uh, suburb of Columbus. And right. if you look up Pickerington uh, Central football, we've been – so there's two high schools here. There's Pickerington North and Pickerington Central. Pickerington Central has been in a state title game four years in a row. So it's Division One. They're one of the top – I would say 15 programs in the United States. Pickerington North is right on their tail. So what you have here is you have, you ever seen the movie Friday Night Lights? Yeah. Oh yeah. So you remember when he's talking at the beginning, he says, you're in the business of protecting this town, boys. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of how it is here. Pickerington football is huge here. On and a national level. That on a national town. level, yeah. um, the number yeah. one recruit in the entire nation, his name is Jack Sawyer, if you want to look it up, not in his position, in the entire nation, um, who's who just went to Iowa State, played for Pick North, which is where I uh, coach at. Um, so this is football town. So yeah. everybody wants to play. Every, people move here to play. Now, we don't recruit. 
Um, like if you look at the two best high schools in the nation, it's probably it's probably modern day and St. John Bosco in California. Uh, they actually recruit. So they're recruiting kids from all over the country. But we don't actually recruit, but some people do move here to play. Um, but it's I'm just telling you this to kind of set the stage on what no, football this is, is excellent. like here. This is excellent. This is because Canadians, we know, like, you know, well, my generation, we, we started playing football in grade 10 or grade nine. And we always knew the American kids start when they're like, you know, when they have shoes. crawling. Right. <laughs> so we always knew that that's why it was tough to make, you know, for any Canadian to make the big leagues. Because they just didn't have like by the time they get to college ball, they only had like five years of ball. And you guys would have like, you know, 14, like an entire lifetime of football. So so I know you you got those crazy towns. And then when traveling in the States, I know what it's like to be driving like to the hotel and in the cab and you pass a stadium and it's like a high school stadium. You're like, <laughs> that's a high school. You see the sign, you know, and you're like, holy shit, these guys yeah. are crazy. So that's a Canadian's perspective on the football religion okay. in the States. And I know you're right in the in the Holy Land. <laughs> we're right in the holy land and um i'm trying to be one of the 12 disciples i'm trying to be the 13th disciple so <laughs> but uh so we have um so my kids started playing in youth league youth league here is incredibly competitive so the youth league is the feeder system for pickerington north and pickerington central so my kids played a second year and the the coach of their team was was pretty generous letting me kind of participate as a parent. You know, usually as a coach, you tell the parents, be quiet, stay on the sideline. Yeah, yeah. We got this one parent that might know a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was very nice to me. Um, and I got to know some of the coaches. And then one coach, one year, he was talking to me. He was actually at the All-Stars tournament here for the kids. And he said, man, you know a lot about football. And I said, I love football. And he, he said, would you want to coach with me next year? And I said, if I can run your offense, I'll do it. So um, we were all Making set. Demands. You get that, Dusty? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Right from oh, the jump. Hey, wait <laughs> until if I can run the demands. offense. <laughs> wait, wait until you hear my salary demands. It's going to blow your mind. So, <laughs> so, uh, so this guy, he let me coach, and I was all fired up. And then you remember what happened to me last May, right? So I have a heart attack. So he just assumed I wasn't going to coach. So that was in May. July rolls around. I'm like, hey, I, I got the playbook done. He's like, you're coaching? I was like, yeah. He's like, you just had a heart attack. I said, I don't care. I'm coaching, man. Yeah, I'm training legs, too. <laughs> so yeah, I was training legs at the time. I had, so I was wearing, like, these heart monitors to track that, that would send signals and all this stuff overnight. So I looked like Iron Man out there on the practice fields. I had these little devices hooked up to my chest. And the kids were all like, wow. And I was like, yeah, I'm Iron Man. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, I'm out there in a 90-degree heat running around. Like, I, this is probably a really bad idea, but hey. So anyways, I'll, I'll condense the story down now and make it real short. So the team I coached, um, you know, I was the offensive coordinator and we won the championship and the offense I ran was miles ahead of everybody else. We ran, I mean, we ran three by two, two by two. We ran jet, we ran counters, we, we ran everything. And, you know, the kids here are so good. A lot of people, are they don't give them enough credit. They're like, that's too advanced for them. That's too complicated for them. I even ran some Mill Huddle. Um, actually, I don't have a book with me right now. But hey, anyway, that's know, actually what know, I was working on. they know all the codes, no Huddle, fuck. Well, so there's never been um, no Huddle really run well in youth league. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm about to change that. So anyways, um, so our team, we just kind of ran through everybody. We had a tough tough game and a title game, but we, we won that game. So then, so I'm coaching youth league. So the next step up is Pickerington Central and Pickerington North, the junior highs and high schools. So um, those coaches started hearing, man, this Meadows kid, he really knows how to coach. So I got a chance to talk to both of their coaches at the high school. Well, one of them, the high school coach, and the other one, it was another coach. And I ended up going with um, a coach at North who would let me run my own offense for the most part, I mean, you got to use their terminology so the kids are trained when you get up to the high school, which I'm totally cool with. So um, that's what I'm doing. That's how that opportunity came. And like, it's when you get a coaching position here in Pickerton, it's like it's a big deal. It's like a really big deal. Right. So you know, I spend probably I would <laughs> say anywhere from two to six hours every day 
just studying football, studying schemes and, you know, all, of course it all has to do with the talent you get too, but you know, no matter what talent I have, I've got a pretty good idea what I'll be able to do with them. So I'm super excited. What, what are some of the things that you brought to the offense that, like you mentioned some of them, like counter, you're running everything. You're running like a, like a full grown pro league offense. What were some of the things that, that kind of worked the best and got the kids the most excited? So that's one of the keys right there, getting kids excited and kids love to do what they see on TV. So, you know, what happens in, what happens in these younger leagues is everybody loads the box and they don't respect the pass. So, if you have a good quick game, like if you're running bubble screens or now screens, if you're running rub routes, you know, if you're doing things like that, you can get, you know, seven, 10 yards of pop, 15 yards of pop, or you can break one tackle and be gone. I mean, football really is a game of numbers. So essentially, if you have a quarterback that can look in the tackle to tackle box, count people. OK, there's seven people in the box. So that means my guys on the outside have got them outnumbered somewhere. So you look to the left. Maybe you have two receivers over there. Maybe they have one corner. Maybe the linebacker is not really out far enough because he's so worried about the run. Yeah, you got a two to one advantage over there. So if you've got a quick pattern, you can hit. Eventually, the defense, if they have any brains, they'll say, well, I need to slide this linebacker out. So now what did you just do to the box? You just opened the box up to run the ball. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he sees numbers out there. It's two on two. Well, let's look over on this side. Or maybe you're in trips. you got three receivers on one side, one on the other. You look on the trip side. Well, they really only got two guys over there. So, you know, you run something over there, they got to respect it. So basically you try to get them to move people out of the box so you can open up the run. And if you have a quarterback and you have a scheme that's really good at that, it's really hard to stop you as an offense. Right, right. I remember my high school team, we had a fantastic quarterback. He was one of those team leader guys that was also the starting safety and the starting quarterback and the team captain. You know, like we had one of those guys, right? And so we were just lucky because we had this crazy passing game that most of the other high schools didn't have, you know, because he had that that ability to slow things down and read the field and find the open guys. And you must you must see some of the kids must be just standouts once you give them these tools. eh? Yeah. And, and you know, what you can do is you can make it real fun. Like I had one. A uh, group of players that I call the Avengers, and I'd say I need the Avengers in. So these kids are all excited; they'd run in. And then I had another personnel package that I called the X Men. So I'd say <laughs> I need the X Men package. So those kids would all run in; they're all excited. Um, <laughs> but if I mean, if you're if you're really good at motivating, and and you know, so now this year I have packages for certain kids. So they don't know this yet, but there's probably four or five kids that I'm going to have a play just for them, and I'm going to let them pick a superhero. So. You know, it's a basic what's well, not I wouldn't call it a basic play, but it's a play within the scheme of the offense, but it's for them and they get excited about that. You know, so I like to do things like that um, for the kids. So they're excited. And, you know, I did that with one kid uh, last year and he went and told his mom, hey, mom, I'm going to get the ball. I'm going to get the ball. He was all excited. <laughs> and um, so it's really fun. It's really exciting. And. Um, I just I, I just really enjoy it. So I put a lot of time into it. And, you know, the guys around here that know me, um, they're all like, we've never seen anybody this like like this. That's this crazy. Like <laughs> like every time someone calls me, I'm like, hang on, I'll call you back. I'm I'm studying a, a tackle over tackle jet sweep right now. So um, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, you might get a kick out of this, but I actually had a play named after me in the playbook. What's it, what was it called? It was the Ron Trap. Okay, so you were the tailback, so no, it was a trap no, play? I, I was the guard. They named it after me. Oh, that's right. Me. You were the guard. Okay. Yeah, so but I was I, so I was cutting behind the center and hitting the far end in the ear hole. Okay. Opening up the right. defensive end, right? Opening the tackle end hole on the far side. And gotcha. we the play did have a name, but then once I joined the offensive line to play both ways, they changed the name to the Ron Trap because I think we only used the play like – five or six times in the in the in the last season and we scored on every single time we used it so it was like it was like we'd bring it out when we were inside the 10 we'd be like okay ron trap time <laughs> we'll open yeah. up that big hole so it's it, it was a blast man i had a lot of fun but it, yeah. you're naming them after superheroes you're like iron man sweep and <laughs> x-men goal line stand and stuff you uh you've got this link with the superheroes 
that you've had through all of your coaching and all, <laughs> all your life and your coaching and your uh, your repulsion of death, which you've done twice and uh, all this sort of stuff. Uh, w w what do you think the this might be funny, but I, I have here comic books slash superheroes. I wanted to get into that with you. And this seems like an opening for it. So what what do you think the kind of love of superheroes and comic books has added to your mentality, uh, all this stuff you do, the the coaching period, coaching of everyone, as well as like your inventiveness and your the fun you have writing up new stuff. Because I mean, you're just writing programs is all you're doing, writing plays. It's the play, same thing, right? And, yeah, and that's funny it, you it, mentioned that. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. that's you, you, it's exactly the same. You're, you're coaching and you're writing writing new plays. And and it's all like uh, this motivation and kind of inspiration from the superhero world. Can you speak on that? Well, I mean, I never wanted to be normal. And um, even I think I've talked to you guys about this before. Like even when I'm training, one of the things I took a little bit of pride in was I can't do the stuff anymore. But back when Dave Tate and I were going full tilt and even before that, I used to walk out of the gym and I would think there's not many people on this planet that could handle what we just did. Like, right. Like there's literally not. And I took I took a measure of pride in that. Like I'm not like everybody else. And, you know, I'm also very good at being honest with myself. And in bodybuilding, I, I was very it was very obvious to me that I didn't have a great structure and I would need to be something special in order to have any success at all on the stage. So that was kind of my what I considered my secret weapon is is I figured I could do things that other people couldn't do. I could push harder than other people could push. And I also figured out, you know what, um, I need to be really smart about this because I see people falling by the wayside injury after injury after injury. And I had to figure out a way that I could keep, you know, being abnormal, but stay in one piece, because I think there's a lot of people that can push themselves hard, but then they're injured all the time. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. We all we probably all of us on this podcast at some point when you're thinking about superheroes, you always thought about, man, I wish I had that superpower. What superpower would I like? Yeah. And we've all <laughs> thought about that. Right. That's kind of an interesting question to ask people. And, um, you know, what superhero, what superpower would you like to have? And, um, you know, I've thought about like reading people's minds or doing stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's I want super strength. Right. Yeah. I mean, I want to go pick up a, a semi and, and throw it into the next, you know, <laughs> that's what we want at the end of the day. Right, Dusty? We want super Absolutely. strength. So, um, now that I'm older, it might be super speed. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, I would I, I would like endless rejuvenation. Yeah, well, like Wolverine, that'd be pretty cool, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. then hopefully I could live long enough to just make the money that I want. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. You know, you, do yeah. you wish for money or you do wish for like something else so you can just live long enough to make the money, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing about near-death experiences, though, man. When you have those, like the money stuff, kind of like, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say it's not important, but you start to realize like, man, there's a lot more to life than just money. And, and um, you start to see things a little differently. And I'm sure Dusty can attest to this. When you're in a, when you're in a situation where you could literally be dead, then all of a sudden you start thinking about, oh, man, what really matters? Is it that 20 bucks I saved or is it that friendship I have with, you know, James or whoever? Yeah. So <clears throat> it's a it's a it's a unique way to get motivated uh, and get your priorities in a certain order. Now, some people go through bad experiences and they don't, you know, kind of react the same. They kind of get bitter and have you know, a lot of bad feelings. And I, you know, that's unfortunate. But for me, like those near death experiences are um, a real important part of me becoming who I am and sure. become a, a much better person, I would say. So anyways, getting a little off track there. But no, no it's funny because uh, I actually wanted to talk about that, um, that whole thing. You know, Dusty just went through obviously something huge. And so I thought it might be good for him to hear from you, like how, you know, maybe go back to your first one, the intestinal thing that happened. Was that 05? It was 05, yes. Yeah, 05. So um, how long was it before you kind of stopped thinking about it? You know what I mean? Like where it was like you weren't thinking about it every day or whatever. How long did so, that take? Um, 
I actually I actually really like talking about that experience because I feel that it made a real positive impact to my life in many different ways. Um, you know, I was preparing for the USA. I got real sick. I ended up in emergency surgery, you know, surgery right away, removed my colon. And so when that happened, um, there was another series of events that didn't even really get published that happened after that. So when you lose your colon, you know, you, they um, they have to do more surgeries. You know, I had a ileostomy, which is a, a temporary situation where ileum is pulled to your stomach. And then they it's like a colostomy, but it's not your colon, it's your ileum. Anyways. I'll, I'll keep this short. They, um, I had a, a series of surgeries after that that resulted in infections. And I was actually thinking about Dusty when this, you know, when the J- Dusty situation happened, because I had one thing that led to a surgery that led to an infection that led to all kinds of other things. And that's what Dusty had. He had this snowball effect. And um, when I finally got through that, it was six months later. And <clears throat> I remember going back to the gym. And uh, I remember getting on a leg extension and I remember putting it was a selectorized leg extension. I remember putting the pin on one plate. Yep. <laughs> I don't know if it's 40 pounds or what it was, but it was one plate. And my legs were just shaking, quivering, trying to get that up one time. And I remember I weighed 162 pounds. You could see the, out, the outline of like my pelvic girdle, like the bones. You could see them through through, um, you know, there was no no muscle on top of them. And I have a log. Um, I was logging my workouts and the workouts were like, hold on to, I would step outside on my back porch. I would hold on to the, to the, uh, you know, the, so you don't fall off the porch. I would hold on to that and I would squat down and do 10 reps, just my body weight. Right. And I had little like three or four pound dumbbells and I'd do like 10 curls. I would try to do 10 side laterals. So I was very, very weak, but it didn't matter. I didn't care in the slightest bit. What I cared about was I was alive. And mm-hmm. when I woke up in ICU, so you got to realize when they were rushing me in the ICU, I was in shock, but I was conscious and I could understand what was going around me. And judging by the way the nurse ran out of the room and they said prepping for surgery, prepping for surgery, I knew something bad was happening in addition to all the blood coming out of me. Um, so I didn't think I was going to wake up. So right. when I woke up in ICU, I was like, where am I? Like, am I alive? And she was like, yeah, you're in, you're in intensive care at Mount Carmel hospital. I was like, really? And I said, am I going to live? She's like, yeah, you're going to be fine. I was like, seriously? (laughs) So I was ecstatic because my expectation was like, I was done. I was going to die. And I woke up and she said, you're going to live. You're going to be fine. So even though I went through those, those further tribulations, I was alive, man. I was alive. (laughs) So I was really, really happy. I was really happy. And then when I got into the gym, the first day I was doing those ladies engines and this trainer, you know, I was friends with the trainers. Well, first of all, when I walked in, there were a lot of people that double takes. They didn't even recognize me. They're like, I think I know him, but that's not really him. Right. Um, So anyways, this trainer, I'll never, ever forget this. She walks up to me. She's like, I'm really surprised to see you in here. I was like, well, I'm super happy to be here. Why are you surprised? She's like, well, you know, you're just so small now. I thought you probably wouldn't feel comfortable coming in here. I said, are you kidding me? Like, I love the gym. Like, so my my self-esteem, I don't think there's probably too many people in bodybuilding that can say this. Literally has had almost zero to do with bodybuilding. I mean, I'm not going to say zero because I do have a little bit of an ego. But generally speaking, if I lose an inch on my arms – I don't cry myself to sleep at night. Right. Right. It's it's just how I think. I'm I am much more proud of who I am as a person than what I ever did as a bodybuilder. So for me, um, I was happy. I was happy to be alive. And I knew the strength and size would come back. And it did. I knew that it would come back. In fact, in fact, so what I did, hopefully, Dusty, you're not doing it. In fact, what I did was I kind of got a little careless and I gave myself incisional hernias um so you know all those surgeries i kept having they were cutting right down the midline my linea alba and every time you know they do it a lot cleaner now but i was in an emergency situation i had 32 staples going down me then they stapled me again the second time and then they stapled me again the third time so i had like the the fascia tissue cut through three times my linea alba basically melted so I had diastasis recti, which is what pregnant women get when their abs pull apart. Yeah. And then I had another surgery to sew my abs back together, and they're still connected like that. But 
I got a little too overzealous, and actually that tissue was so weak I gave myself hernias by doing bent over stuff. I'm still really cautious with anything bent over. But, um, you know, it took me, once I felt decent and I could train, the muscle came back really quick. It, it, it comes back quick. If you've built your muscle working hard like someone like Dusty's done, the muscle comes back. Like, if there's yeah. one thing I could say to Dusty, he'd be like, don't even worry about the strength and muscle because it'll all come back. It will. Yeah. It just will. Yeah. Um, what, what What do you think of that? That begs the question. You know how we sort of, you know, in the last, I don't know how many years, 10 years, we sort of been talking about like um, structural protein growth and then like sarcoplasmic growth. And the old the old way we used to explain it was, well, you know, a certain amount of your muscle is from lifting heavy. And then a certain amount is from, you know, drugs and food. That's how we used to kind of word it, right? And and you, you, you know how hard someone trains. This was the old myth. You know how, well, I don't know if it's myth, but you know how hard someone trains by how much of their muscle is actually structural. And the explanation would be, you know, if someone were to lose all their weight, it would come back much faster on someone who had like structural muscle. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm using the old yeah. terms that we we used to use before the science oh, yeah. kind of oh, yeah. got Miles into it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? We'd say like oh, structural tissue versus like, you know, intracellular um, volume, you know, and um you know, you think that the the way you trained and added your muscle probably had something to do with the fact that it all came back? It, I'm sure it did. Um, you could also say that just all the training in general, maybe there's an increase in satellite cells. And right. so even doing all that stuff, even the even the pump training, whatever you call it, would probably still theoretically have an impact on satellite cells and yeah. um and then neuromuscular so, stuff as well. Yeah, but I think I think overall the yeah probably um, laying down more muscle tissue is uh, you know as opposed to it just being you know those um, passive elements or whatever you call them these days. I'm not as sharp on my science as I used to be, but I can tell you all about pulling guards and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, hey, um, that's science. So I mean, there's probably a lot to that, and you know I um. I also think that you can only get so strong. Um, and then at some point, you know, it just becomes a matter of here's because here's how I look at training now. I look at training now in a very a much more simplified way than I used to. Like when you're trying to find the holy grail of training and you're sitting there and you're trying to figure out the perfect everything. What it really comes down to is just a couple really basic things. It's are you activating muscle fibers? Mm -hmm. So you can do that with heavy weight because with heavy weight, you have to produce more force and more muscle fibers are called in action. You can do it with a little bit more lightweight as long as you're going closer to failure. So fibers fatigue and call in more fibers. So you have activation. But if it was just activation, we could just jump up and down all day and have huge quads. But there's no mechanical loading. So you need mechanical tension, mechanical loading. So you probably have to have a certain amount of weight. Um, as well to create mechanical tension. I mean, I mm -hmm. see people doing these lat, lat rows with tiny, tiny weight with perfect form. I'm like, yeah, your form's great, but there's probably enough, not enough weight there to even create enough tension to grow. And then I think there's a certain level of exhaustion that I can't really put into scientific terms, but it's giving your body something it hasn't done before. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a cluster set. Maybe it's like one of Dante's Widowmaker sets. Things like that sprinkled in to challenge your body in a different way. And I think if you do that, if you have an exercise that you feel great and you get activation, you load it and you fatigue fibers, if you're doing those things, I don't really see where anything else beyond that makes, it doesn't really matter. Like if Dusty mm -hmm. feels better with exercise A, I don't care what that exercise is. If, he, if he's able to accomplish those three things with that exercise, he's good to go, right? right. So he's good to go. It doesn't matter what it is if he gets loading and he gets exhaustion and activation what else you need that so that's why people say well john you change exercises too much okay talk to me about that what am i doing in the second exercise where i do two hard sets of eight and i do a cluster set i want you to explain to me why that doesn't work right well you don't have the the you haven't reinforced your 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 neuromuscular patterns i'm like really so 
I've got to do the same exercise years. every week. <laughs> I mean, like, really? That's the best you have? Yeah. But I hear people saying that if you don't do this basic exercise every single week, you got you, you lose the neuromuscular coordination. I'm like, OK, guys, you're you're taking what beginners need and you're saying that advanced people need the same thing beginners need. Right. Beginners and advanced people. There's two different worlds. They're completely different. Yeah. yeah. And and, see, and, you know, and then beyond advanced, there's you. <laughs> well, I mean, I just I just think that you know there's I mean? really no reason why why advanced guys should be they should be getting as hurt and as injured as they are. Right. Um, because there are ways you can load fatigue, like there are ways you can do that without destroying your joints. Like, you know, you can do that. So do you, do you think that the progressive overload style, I guess we'll call it genre of training, ha- gets a little too focused on the load part, the progressive overload. Well, you make a, a good point because load, load is only. I mean, you make a good point because load is only one part of it. You know, yeah, what if you do more sure. reps? What if you do, you know, it, again, it's just giving your body something it hasn't done before. You know, maybe you maybe you add on two reps. You know, the last program I wrote my progressions the next week, I said, I want you to do two more reps with this last week than than, than you did last week. Because the fact is, there ain't a single one of us that are going to continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger forever. Forever, yeah. So you can't just say the only way to grow muscle is to get stronger. You can't say that. And there are tons of bodybuilders out there that can anecdotally say, here's some pictures of me in 2015 and here's in 2019. I got a lot bigger, but I didn't really get that much stronger. Um, I could give you some great examples of that. But um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't strive to get stronger. I'm just saying that's just one way to get bigger. And I could also tell you there's a lot of powerlifters that are incredibly strong that aren't very big. Yep. So they got the activation, they got the mechanical loading, but they didn't have they weren't exhausting muscle fibers, right? I used to train yes. with a guy when I when I was at Westside. He was a five five fifty one pound bencher and he was in a one eighty one class. Now, if you saw him, he didn't look like he lifted weights. He wasn't yeah. a big dude. But when we benched, I was I was I was lifting in the two twenties. He was smoking me. Now, some people would say, well, John's got a lot more muscle than him. He should be doing a lot more. No, strength is different. Strength is different. There's the ability to recruit muscle fibers. It's the type of muscle fibers. Um, it's I'm actually, yeah. It's There's so much that goes into that. Like if you're just pure bodybuilding, I still think it always just comes back to pick an exercise you feel, load it, fatigue the fibers. And then your rep range, you know. If you're a lower rep range guy, that's fine. But eventually you just kind of get banged up so you can bring your reps up. But yeah. if you're doing high reps, you've got to go closer to failure. So if you're doing think about think about how hard a set is of 20 reps to failure. Think about how hard that is, how much it burns. Now, yeah. try now. Realistically, tell me somebody can do sets like that all the time year round. Nobody can handle that. Yeah. You so down. there's this there's this. Um, intuitiveness you have to have well i'm going to go a little lower reps on this but maybe higher on this okay now my body my joints aren't maybe feeling that good i'm going to bump my reps up or today i feel real strong and my joints feel good maybe i'm going to lower my reps a little bit so there's this intuitiveness that you get as you get older you should get that allows you to kind of guide your rep range and it could be the exercise you could notice like for example if i do high rep barbell stuff my elbows start to get pretty fired up so I know from certain exercises doing higher reps, I know that it creates tendonitis for me. Um, there's certain exercises that just cause joint pain for me. You know, if I go to do a heavy barbell skull crusher or if I do a heavy behind a neck press, I can guarantee you with 100 percent certainty the next day my elbows and shoulders are going to be hurting. Mm-hmm. So should I just say I'm going to be hardcore and do that? So, I, you know, I mean, I guess the surgeons, my surgeon would be happy about that. But, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> So yeah. I don't know. I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of intuitiveness that, you know, you have to kind of get through the years. But um, I'm not sure that people really get that part of it. I think the key, though, is you said through the years, because I think early on, a lot of guys, they want to think they're thinking that way because they're avoiding shit they don't want to do. You know, like it's much easier to go and do extensions than, than squat. So, you yeah. know what I mean? But if you're finding the movement and you do it correctly, you find why you are or are not doing something that makes more sense, you know, because I get guys and Ron knows this. It's a question on the regular. I mean, I'll put up a video doing heavy skull crushers, like you said, and someone will say, 
man, my elbows are torn up from those. What should I do? And I'm like, it seems so obvious. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't do <laughs> like, it. Yeah, yeah. This is not a magic movement. Do something else, you know? I try to explain to people that 225 pound straight bar skull crushers aren't for everybody. You know, we don't all have the same elbows. No, 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 no. They're just they're just for Dusty and a select few uh, crazy people. I I, I uh, also tell people when they say, you know, like the new studies that we've had out, like that meta study that Schoenfeld put up about the rep range is not really mattering. It was just the effort. Yeah. Um, so I was I'm like, that's ex- that sounds totally sensible to me. And I always just thought lower reps were a little more efficient because they took less time. Like a, a set of failure of eight reps is just more efficient than a set of failure at 20 reps because it just, you know, you're huffing and puffing more. It takes longer. It's more demanding cardio wise. So that's why when people say, oh, you know, do you think lower reps are better? I go, well, no, they are more, like, you know, the definition of efficiency is, you know, has to do with time. So they are technically more efficient, but yeah. then you got joint issues and how old are you and how stupid have you already been? And, right. you know, all these, <laughs> did you play football? You know, <laughs> all these things. So, um, yeah, I, I think that one of the reasons why everyone has always looked to you for training advice is because you have a knack of taking stuff that might be complicated and simplifying it for people to understand. And, you know, did you know that that was a, a strong point of yours early on? I think that um, I went through phases like when I was in my early 20s, I was winning every show in Ohio and I got a little full of myself and I thought I was better than what I really was. And um, I went to do a Weinberger show called the um, Eastern USA, two weeks for the Nationals. It was Mm -hmm. the first show I've done out of state. And um, do you remember a guy named Johnny Moya? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was a beast, right? Remember? him? Yeah. New York guy, right? Yeah. So I did that show and I saw Johnny Moya backstage and he looked like a complete alien to me. He looked like a freak. And they're like, he's a middleweight. And I was like, that's what a middleweight looks like at this level. Um, (laughs) At the time, I was a light heavyweight. I was like, well, then I literally look like a lightweight compared to him. And I wasn't in the first call out. It was a very humbling experience. I hadn't quite learned my lesson, so I went to nationals. And if you remember, what they used to do at the national shows was they would call a weight class. They'd say, like, lightweights line up, and all the lightweights would line up, middleweights line up. So I remember I was running a little bit behind, and I ran in there, and I saw these huge dudes lined up, and I jumped in line thinking it was a light heavyweight. And then I heard them say, light light heavyweights get ready. And I realized I was in the middleweight line, (laughs) and I was – and I got crushed that show. It was the 1998 at Nationals in Atlanta. And um, there were 42 guys in my class. Uh, Craig, Craig Richardson was in it. He got, I think Craig got fifth or sixth. And uh, Fred Bego, you probably don't remember Fred, Vinny Galani. It was a really tough oh, class. Vinny Galani, yep. Um, I didn't get, Vinny got six. I didn't make the top 15. And, of course, afterwards I was like, oh, there's no way 15 guys are better than me. And I'm looking at the pictures, and I was like, if they did a top 30, I don't think I would have been in a top 30. Like I, I got smoked. I mean, I literally got killed. So it, um, it, 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 first of all, set me down set me down a few pegs. Like you're not as good at this as you think you are. And I think that was helpful for me because I realized how far I had to go. And for me, I had to think, how am I going to get better? And I had to start really thinking like a problem solver right. instead of just thinking I know everything. Because I think the way I was training back then, I kind of had this thing in my head like I'm smarter than everybody else. But I really wasn't. In fact, I wasn't that smart at all. But when that happened, it was like pretty clear to me I, there, I'm missing something. Like I need to get a lot better at this. And I'm a, I am a problem solver. So um, then I had a point that happened in my life I'll never forget. So that was 1998. So 1999, I went to the USA, which was from November to July, and I came in as a heavyweight, and I got fourth. That was the year Melvin Anthony won. I made really good improvements that year. Nobody could believe that was me. But I really, truly, you know, a lot of people say to go back to the drawing board. I really, truly did that, and I thought about what wasn't working. 
this is where, you know, when I talk about all the crazy back stuff I do, all the different variations. So yeah. that's when I was thinking, I'm doing all the stuff everybody says to do for your back. I've been doing it for years, but my back is still terrible. Right. So should I just keep doing the same stuff or should I try something new? And that's when the mentality started hitting me. You know what, John, maybe you need to think about some of the movements you're doing. Um, I don't think it was a lack of effort. I just think it was a lack of training intuition, knowing what really worked for me and what didn't work for me. I think that was the biggest change. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the USA and I got fourth. And I remember a guy, there was a guy named Jim Seitzer. Jimmy used to train Mike Francois back when Mike first came on the scene. Okay. There was a guy named Greg Gonzalez here and a guy named Jim Seitzer. Jim Seitzer was in the Mr. America in the 70s. He competed against Tom Platts. He was the last guy to ever beat Lee Haney when Lee Haney was a teenager. He beat Lee Haney in a teenage Mr. America. Jim's a great guy. And so Jimmy comes in. There's a, there's a video on my YouTube from me squatting six plates, and I think I'm doing it seven or eight times. I used to do that every Saturday. And Jimmy's guy that actually filmed that. And when I did that that day, Jimmy, he was like, you know what, man? He's like, you're the most creative. Like what you've done in the last six months to a year, he said, you're the most creative bodybuilder I've ever seen. And when he said that, that was one of the best compliments I ever got. And I took that to heart. And like, uh, here it is 20 years later, and I'm still thinking about that. Mm -hmm. But um, so I took some pride in the fact that, you know what, I could discard what doesn't work. I could try to think through and figure out what was what would work. And so then, you know, you get in this game where you just try to get a little better year after year after year. And you just hope that eventually that adds up. <laughs> right. Yeah. A little better every – it's a game of inches, just like football. That's right, just like Al Pacino said. <laughs> what, what's, what's, what's the best football movie ever made? Remember the Titans. Oh, okay. Remember. Didn't the even Titans. pause. Didn't even slow down that answer. Why, why is that a dominant win? Because it's a life lesson as well. It's, uh, you know, back during the – you know, where, you know, racism was so prevalent. And, and, and I, um, I just really – that movie, everybody – that should be required watching for people in school – um, right. it's just a great message to the movie. Great movie. Um, I also like varsity blues. I thought that was a fun movie. Right. right. So every time I hear, um, so Rami's music thunderstruck, every time I hear that, I think of that. You remember when the boys walked out of the bar, they stayed out all night partying right. and then the next, <laughs> and then that night at the football game, they're getting smashed and thunderstruck's playing. Like I see tweener getting dumped on his head after he gets hit. I like, I visualize all this stuff. That was a cool movie too. Friday Night Lights was a cool movie. That well, that 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 has the Pacino speech in it, right? No, that's um. That's any given Sunday. Any yeah. given Sunday. Any given Sunday. Now there's some good older ones too. The program was phenomenal. Well, oh, yeah. so that was my generation's first hardcore football movie, right? That's hardcore. No. Starting defense. You know, a seat table. at the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah. you know, uh, and then we used to say, we used to say that line, you know, kill them all, let the paramedics sort them out. Yeah. You I know? need to get a t-shirt that says that, man. We used to, yeah. So we had that, like our safety, I think it was one of our guys had it written on his helmet too. Like we had like that sort of stuff. That was our, that was like the, the movie back then, you know? Yeah. And then uh, I always think of Rudy. Oh, Rudy. So. Okay, I, let me let me tell you a quick story. You know, I love to tell stories. I love it. So I I wanted to walk on to Michigan and be Michigan's version of Rudy. That was my goal. Okay. So I applied to go to Michigan, and I got denied academically, and I graduated third in my class. <laughs> so there went that dream of being Michigan's version. I just wanted to be on the practice squad and get hammered, oh, yeah. get the crap kicked out of me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe get thrown in for one play at the end of the year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a great movie. Phenomenal movie. Uh, I've got a bunch of IG questions, Dusty. Do you want to hammer John with some of these? We can. Absolutely. I know we say we're going to rapid fire, and then you know we always have these great guests on that give us 10-minute answers, so that's okay. Yeah, we if we get them. three of these done, John, it'll be fantastic, because that's pretty much our goal every time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we got 30. Oh, wow. They're still rolling in. If you want to start, you, you want to start with one or you want me to start with one? Uh, go ahead and I'm going to find one. OK, we're going to do a, a fuck, Mary kill. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> Hack squats, RDLs and the Bulgarian split squad of death. Oh, God. Um, all right. Hold on. 
<laughs> he's going to do math. <laughs> okay. Carry the five. He's, got an, he's got an equation for this. Hacks, Bulgarians, and what was the other one? RDLs. RDLs. RDLs, eh, they're boring. So that's going to be kill. Those are boring. Um, Mary, it's, that's going to be the Bulgarians. Because that really, if you truly do that set, there's nothing harder. Right. Like if you do that right, that's 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 love, man. That's passion. So okay, that's gonna be okay. the Mary. Okay. Okay. So I guess that leaves the other one for hacks. And then hacks, you do you go nuts on every every four weeks, like the mistress. Yeah. <laughs> there <you go. laughs> now uh, here's a question for you. You you dismissed RDLs pretty quickly. Do, do you consider them a different exercise from stiff leg deadlifts? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Same here. I always call stiff legs like what Dorian did in Blood and Guts, like a hamstring dominant deadlift. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what's an RDL to you? Well, I primarily would use RDLs to get glutes involved. I would push my hips back to get more glute. Oh. But it's it's hamstring. It's hamstring. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying they're like it's like if the straighter your legs are, the more the load is on your hams and less on your glutes. So to me, the RDL is just a little bit more glute. Okay. Um, so and now I will tell you this. I used to love them when I was younger, but now with a creaky old back, I don't really love them that much anymore. Does, I, did them, I did them today, right. but it doesn't mean I love them anymore. See, back, back when I was young, we used, to, we used to think RDLs were just stiff leg deadlifts, but you touch the floor. That's how we defined them. <laughs> okay. Because we like, you'd see somebody like kind of do a stiff leg off the floor and we'd be like, oh, those are RDLs. You know what I mean? But that was uh-huh. like back in the day. And then and I know some people think stiff leg deadlifts are like dead straight legs with like light weights, but that's not how I, I ever did them. That's a good way to get injured, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a great way to tear something. Yeah. You see people yeah. doing those? Crazy. You got one, Dusty? Yeah, and I'm actually curious about this one. What got you into bodybuilding? Oh, that's a simple one. So it was just reading muscle magazines when I was 12 years old. It was – um, I was reading muscle and fitness um, back then, and – um i just as soon as i opened up the magazine i knew that's what i wanted to do i, I mean it was very clear to me there wasn't it wasn't a situation where people were picking on me or i was doing it for um now i did train to get stronger for sports but right. um so i i'm not going to say i didn't think about it in those terms but as soon as i looked at a magazine that's what i wanted to look like 100 percent. right what's your favorite comic book it's probably um, – see, this is going to seem like a cop-out, but before Marvel started doing all this build-up to Thanos, that was actually my favorite series. So my two favorite storylines are Galactus and how Galactus is – how he was made. He was uh, – Galen Ta was his name, and he his planet was getting consumed by radiation. So they got into a spaceship and they flew right into the radiation. And then he woke up and he was Galactus out in space floating around. Um, And obviously then the silver surfer became his herald. So like in terms of how many comic books, like what do I have the most of It's probably the silver surfer series. I've got a stack of silver servers. It's huge because I loved how it all tied into Galactus. And then, you know, Galactus came to earth and, um and then the thanos story like i was reading all the starlin jim starlin stuff way before marvel was doing movies and i remember telling my buddy like i got a friend that's into the comics too and we were like why don't they ever do a thanos story and you know eventually it happened but i always thought those two stories were the best stories um by far no one's like you have to forgive me because i'm not the comic guy you are but no one's done a galactus movie yet at all he hasn't appeared they did they just did very poorly so there was um Lawrence Fishburne was the voice of the Silver Surfer. It was a Fantastic Four movie. Oh he, yeah, yeah, okay. He was he was coming at the end, and he was a cloud, and then he left. Like that's like that's it. That's Galactus. So it was very disappointing. Ah, okay. Now, what about your favorite superhero? Because that's different from comic book. Um, do you mean from the comic world, like DC and Marvel? Sure. Or just all around? I don't know. Are there superheroes from other? I'm just um, trying to think. I Well, I like the cosmic power dudes. So like the Galactuses and the Thanoses. Who else would I like? Um, 
I don't know, man. I really like Silver Surfer, man. He's a cool okay. character. <laughs> okay. Silver Surfer is a really cool character. What did you think of Batman versus Superman? I didn't hate it as much as everybody else did. The only thing I didn't like was um, – so the dude who kills Superman in the comics, what's the big creature's name? Um, I don't know. Um. I knew Superman died in the comic book at one point. Okay, so the guy who killed him in the comics was a creature from the planet Krypton, all right? This is kind of a – this used to be a slide at the seminars I did. My first slide would have a picture of him. I cannot believe – I'm drawing a blank right now on what his name was. Um, Somebody needs a Google and who killed Superman. It will pop right up. (laughs) Right. So um, anyway, so this is – this is actually relates to muscle building. So watch how I turn this into muscle building. All right. I'm waiting. So he was a creature on Krypton. The scientists made and they made him like as a baby and whatever Doomsday. killed him. Doomsday. What? Doomsday. Doomsday. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. So Doomsday was this, you know, baby creature, whatever you want to call him. I don't know what you call him. But whenever something killed him, they went back. They brought his dead body back and they changed his DNA. So whatever killed him couldn't kill him again. Right. So like if he got exposed to cold weather and he froze to death, they would change his DNA so the cold couldn't kill him anymore. Let's say something bit him and killed him. They would change his skin so that something couldn't bite through his skin. So I always thought that was interesting because that's kind of what muscle building is. Like your body adapts. And until you – like if, you, if you're one of those people who says you just do the same thing over and over, then like that's where I, I think, yeah, if you're a beginner, that's fantastic. But when you're advanced, like your body, you've got to give it something that it hasn't adapted to yet is mm-hmm. how I kind of relate to that. So it's like bodybuilding is doomsday. That's what it is. It's like giving your body something it hasn't seen before, right? Instead of just giving it the same stress because it's already seen that. It's not going to do anything to it. How do you like that one? That's fantastic. <laughs> I, uh, I I love how every seminar you've ever given has superheroes in it. That's crazy. Um, That's your your turn, Dusty. Uh, okay, this is a good one, actually. Who is the best person you've ever trained with intensity-wise? So who's the most intense person you've ever trained with? Oh, man, I, I've trained with some awesome people, man. Um, I knew this would be almost brutal, almost impossible. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I haven't really trained with anybody where I was disappointed, where I thought, man, they didn't know. I mean, see, that's actually I actually love that you said that because. People need to realize that pretty much everyone at the level where they're get to train with john meadows knows how to put the pedal down you know what i mean like people think there's like these two or three people that train harder than everyone and it's just not not the not the way it is no i i I in fact don't like it when i hear people say oh the old school guys trained harder i don't see it that way um i think there's a lot of guys that train their butt off now i got nothing but respect for him man um I don't, I mean, I, I really haven't had, like, when I think of people who came here and trained, um, like, they all just worked their butts off, man. I tell you what, I've had some women that are straight killers here, man. I mean, I had a wellness girl here that, I swear to God, doesn't have pain receptors in her body. I'm just like. <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask you about, you know, they say women can tolerate volume and have faster cardio recovery between sets and all that stuff. Like there's some things they say generally about women. Yes. And I've seen it. Like I have put girls through like, you know, uh, brutal rest pause sets on the leg press where they go to failure on all three rounds. And then within 20 seconds of the set, their breathing is normal. Yeah. And they're like, oh, so, you know, my kid drew a really funny picture for me today. And I'm just like, I'm still out of breath from spotting. <laughs> you were counting the reps, <laughs> right? I was still like coming down from the set and they're like totally fine. Like, can we go again? Oh, oh dude, my- you are 100% correct. So there's a girl here that's trained me a couple of times. She's an, she's awesome. Her name's Sunny Andrews. She's, she's, um, qualified for the Olympia. And, um, so Sunny, we're like, we're doing cluster sets on the pendulum. We're doing triple drop sets on glute bridges. There's a huge pond that's behind our gym. We lunge around the entire pond. She's like, well, that was fun. And I'm yeah. like, 
I'm on the verge of having another heart attack. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, they're like, you know, there's, um, there's some women here. I mean, that, you know, I had Ivana came back in town, did some training, Missy Trescott, when she comes here, she's a fly out animal. There's a girl I work with named Teresa Ivancic. She's an absolute beast. I mean, there are some women that come into town here that are really tough, man. I I completely well, Missy's fantastic. We had a great time with her on the show, by the way. Um, here's an interesting one. I know, you know, it happens. How do you <laughs> feel? How do you feel when shitty people do really well in the industry? <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> this feels like a setup <laughs> so this is my i'm just gonna say that's all there is i'm not draw. i'm not coming up with a follow-up so this is my first opportunity this week in a situation where i can be a bad guy okay so every sunday when i go to church one of the things i pray is that i become a better person so you're putting that to the test right now like <laughs> because i'm not even going to sit here and tell you it doesn't bother me because it does um, because there's a lot of people out. No, I won't say a lot. There are a couple people out there that have completely pulled the wool over people's eyes. Mm-hmm. And there are those of us who hear and know things that know what kind of person they are behind the scenes. But you know what? I'm not going to be the guy that gets out there um, and broadcasts it. That's not my job. I'd rather create positive energy than negative energy. But there are a couple turds in this industry for sure. That are that are at a high level. <laughs> I've always seen you as a guy that, um, and I've also tried to follow what you do. Like I've I've always thought of you as an example of just minding your own business and playing the long game, and just you know doing doing right by people, and just allowing that to you know outlast some of those pe- other people. Well, it's not, you know, and it, it, one of the things, so Ron, it's not a, um, well, this company is doing better than my company. It's not one of those things. I'm fine, dude. I have a great life. I have everything I could want. It's what they're doing to other people. Mm-hmm. That's what makes it like, oh, man, man, if, like if you guys only knew, like, what's really going on here. That's where, you know, and and it's it's hard because, you know, I hear these stories and I'm like, yeah, I could have told you that was going to happen to you, you know? Yep. And, but you know, Hey, I, I, I try to mind my, mind my own business. Honestly, man, I got so much going on with football. If I have time to sit around and get engaged in that stuff, then I'm probably doing, I, I'm not doing something I should be doing. Right. So. Right. Well, but, Rob uh, Bailey, Rob Bailey put up a great uh, post the other day um, where he was, he, someone had commented, brutally on one of his posts right and he just did a little story or reel or whatever where he was like someone said something about success the meaning of success and he was like man if you are spending your sunday morning commenting negatively on my stuff then you don't know what successful is like you should have something else to do with your Sunday morning. It's Sunday, bro. <laughs> like he kept saying that it's Sunday morning, bro. So like, <laughs> I, I'll give you an example of that. So, you know, the Olympia this year was a week before or last year was a week before Christmas, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we stayed in Florida. We got home Christmas Eve, Christmas day. I get on my, uh, I get a message, like a notification. Someone on Instagram had said like, I hope you die tonight and like you don't deserve to live. You're a scumbag. And I was like, because apparently I thought so because I said that Shanique should have won the Olympia. Apparently that was worthy of me dying. I should die because my opinion is she should have won the Olympia. Wow. Yeah. I was like, it's Christmas, man. You're sitting (laughs) like, I was like, it's Christmas. It just blew my mind. (laughs) That's your response. It's Christmas. But if you yeah, say nothing that's else, amazing. <laughs> that's unreal. Um, um, I, I got one that uh, I'm actually curious about too. Was uh, says I know John uh, believes in injectable L-carnitine. Have him explain why and his reasonings. 
Well, um, so carnitine isn't very well absorbed, number one. Um, injectable versions are a way to do that. But the problem with injectable carnitine is most people have a bodybuilding mindset that you got to be fast that you do before cardio and all that, which is completely backwards. So you actually have to be hyperinsulinemic in order to establish the kind of the pathway that pushes fat into mitochondria to be burned as energy. You have to actually be in a hyperinsulinemic state. So, you know, you typically would pair that with a little bit of insulin, which you would obviously want to eat carbs with unless you have a desire to go into a diabetic coma. So, you know, the time to do that would actually be before training because then you have the side benefit of more nutrient uh, nutrients being shoved into muscle. You know, insulin's a transporter, right? So um, it is effective. It does work. Um, it's just I think most people do it the wrong way. They do it fasted and they – you know, they don't really, like I said, establish that shuttle because you have to push. The whole point of that is push mitochondria or push, push. Um, you want fat to be burned as energy. And right. um, so you can't really it's it's counterintuitive, I would say, because most of us think, well, if I'm fasted, I'm burning more fat. But this is a totally different pathway. It's a different mechanism. Right. Makes can, sense. Can you think of anything big? bigger picture that you've changed your opinion on completely when it comes to bodybuilding you know in recent years or um i wouldn't say in recent years but there was a point when i realized you didn't have to be sore to make progress that was a pretty big mind that was a pretty big eye opener for me i don't even like to be sore now um i made in in uh the intra workout thing was big for you that was huge so you remember when we competed in 2012 yeah the uh Masters Nationals, was it? A uh, North Americans. Or North American? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that kind of that year is where I had my awakening on recovery. And like I trained that whole year and never got sore one time, but I made huge progress that year. Um, that was the that was a pretty big deal for me. Um, anything else? So I don't know that I would say I think the older I get, the more I feel like this stuff becomes more intuitive. Mm -hmm. That's just something that I can't put in a, a, a mathematical equation, though. It's more um, when to push hard, when to pull back. Like knowing when to do that it seems like a pretty important skill to me now. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say this, too. I think that there's an old saying that I like to use. You never know where the line is until you cross it a little bit. And there's so many people now that are scared to even approach the line, let alone cross it with their training. They're so scared to train hard. Mm -hmm. um, I think people are really shortchanging themselves. And um, that's that's one thing that I feel I don't think my mind's ever going to change on that. You have to at some point put the pedal to the metal. You have to. You know, you, when you're done, you have to find a way to get more reps. Like, I do believe that in, in order for you to reach your ultimate genetic potential, you have to find a way to do that. You can't just, well, I don't, I'm going to be mathematical. Listen, I like to plan and be methodical as well. I like to do that. Mm -hmm. But there's a point where you just got to hit the gas and go pedal to the metal with your training, man. Um, your body will tell you when you need to be careful and back off. You just got to listen to it. That's the magic. People, I think, <laughs> That's the magic. sometimes – uh, I, I think now sometimes people um, are tied up with thinking about what is the perfect program. And there'll be some times, like I've had people train with me over the years, and I'll say, hey, let's uh, finish with, let's go do a huge strip set on a leg press. I know we already did all this other stuff, but let's just, I got something left in the tank. Let's just go do this killer, one killer drop set, and then we'll call it a day. And they'll be like, oh, well, what does that do? Like, what's the function of that? And I'm like, oh, I'm beyond that at this point. I'm just trying to challenge my mind. <laughs> because it's really, f I have a little bit of gas left. There's some monster left in the basement today. And I want to get them out of there. And the only way to do it is just pick something really brutal and hard and let's just finish with it. So sometimes there was a lot of times where training to me was just like you're trying to get mentally stronger too. Oh, for sure. Right. And I think sometimes people are so tied up in the perfect program and like, oh, we're going to go one rep left in reserve on every set and we're going to do this much percentage of our max and we're going to stop here 
And then we're going to stop here because that, that's my recovery says the formula says my recovery is done at that point. <laughs> but then they still feel fine and they walk out of the gym feeling fine. And I just think sometimes you have to like, you know, you got to work the you got to work the mind. I used to tell guys that too. Like it's impressive to hack squat 10 plates aside for 10 reps. But if you want to see if you're insane, put 80 pounds on the extension. Don't hold yourself down and just keep going. Go until you're you cannot stop. I mean, it's it's yeah. nothing. But I mean, I'll watch guys fail as soon as it starts to burn, and I'm like, are you fucking out of your mind? I, I plan on this being a set of minutes, not set, not reps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you right. know, that's yeah. when you find that that gear is something like that. Because I used to use that as a test with people that I worked with one on one. It's like, all right, I'm gonna put this on the extension. Go. I'm like, how many? I'm like, just go. Yeah. We need at least a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that and that's a different that's a different place. It's funny, John. Uh, when I worked with JJ Marsh forever ago, I know you know that name. Um, I love I love this story. I know what you're. No, telling. this is this one's actually different. He he used to put pins all the way up the extension, not one, and move it. Just put them up preset. And when I would fail and I'd touch, he'd pull one, and just keep going until the very end. You're like you got like two plates on there, like 50 pounds, and you're screaming on like three reps. And I remember you'd get up and almost fall over you know and i just remember thinking like this is fun <laughs> like like this is way better than like you know like you like a set of 600 pounds on for three reps eh, it's heavy yeah. but like you know you're, you're not finding jesus there yeah. <laughs> no 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 he's in the 100 rep set of extensions <laughs> exactly exactly Here, here's a here's a business question for you um how, what's your advice for, you know, it's very competitive market out there, the fitness coaching and online coaching, obviously. And I know the market's polluted, but there's also a lot of great coaches out there. What do you think are some of the things that they should focus on for attracting quality clients? Um, for a coach to attract quality clients? Yeah, your advice. I mean, I know you sort of just, you know, people know you, but... What what, um, what do you think, you know, in this sea of shit? <laughs> so the, the ideal position to be in is one where you can be very selective with who you coach. You know, I probably get 10 to 20 requests a week and I've taken maybe two of them in the last three months. So ideally, but if you're not in that position, um, it's hard because I would, I mean, Ideally, you could talk to them and you could have a 10 minute conversation with them about what they want to do, because sometimes you'll find there'll be some red lights. Right. Um, you'll be talking to a guy. He's telling you, hey, John, I, I want to be the Mr. Olympia next year. I'm ready. And then you talk to him. You go, so what shows have you won? Well, I've never competed. OK, so right away we've got there's a disconnect here. Like yeah. you think you can come in here, train for year and be the Mr. Olympia. You've never even competed before. So right now we've already, we already have a disconnect or it's, yeah, I just, I've had six coaches in the last six months. I didn't really like any of them. Okay. That's a little fishy. Like, you know, there's one comedy nominator there and that's you uh, actually. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if you can talk to people and just get a general sense of what kind of person they are. Um, one of the things that I used to do is I would tell everybody, um check back with me in three months and um that would eliminate a lot of people but then sometimes there'd be some of them that would say hey it's been three months and i could see on the email i told them that i'm like wow okay check back in with me in another month and you'd you know i'd, I'd inevitably i'd have people that would keep trying and keep trying and i would say no there's this that's good like this person has he he, he or she must really want to work with me um and I like to have relationships where the person really, really wants to work with me to start off with. I've never been one of those coaches that poaches or goes to shows backstage and, well, if you just work with me, you would have won this show. Give your card right. to all the top three. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because we know there's guys like that. They call and then they find, they'll find one or two people that will go with them that are really good. And then that becomes the face of their coaching. They don't see the other 90 percent of the people they coach that they've, yeah. you know, don't respond to or they've put them on, you know, 10 times the drugs, you know, you know, all that stuff. So I've only asked one person to work with me 
ever, and that was Josh Wade. Josh Wade is the only guy I've ever said, man, I'd really like for you to work with me. And um, I said, if you do, and Josh is the only person I ever said, if you work with me, you will get a pro card for sure. Um, because Josh's physique is, is so much like mine and how it reacts. I could tell that by seeing him. Like, it would be like coaching me. Right. And um, so if you remember Josh and is like, he, he placed his first, like, I mean, almost every pro show he did, he placed in. And if he didn't, yeah. he was close. Mm-hmm. And you never saw Josh out of shape, ever. Um, but other than that, I always wanted it to be a situation where the person really wanted to work with me, number one. And I wanted to just kind of get an idea of what their history was working with other people. So there, I don't have a magic answer for you. You just got to do some investigating. Um, and then some people say, well, I'll pay you whatever. Well, it's not about money. You know, I don't want to be sitting here arguing with someone on the weekends when I'm trying to be with my family because, you know, you had, you know, whatever. You, you decided that you didn't want to. You didn't like X meal, for example. I don't know. Whatever. I just I just don't want to spend time arguing with you. Right. So you just got to do a little bit of background, talk to them. Um, you know, I, that's the best I got for that question. Right. Go ahead, Dusty. Yep. I'm pulling I'm pulling them up here. So uh, actually, I have one already locked and loaded here. Um, what do you think are three keys as a trainer? Uh, so it's kind of the reverse question uh, to set yourself apart. Well, I mean, there's um, there's like bandwagons in training. There's like um, you see certain things like become in vogue. Like right now, it's resistance profiles and it's all that stuff. That's the same stuff Dave Tate and I were doing 10, 11 years ago with bands. I was using um, bands in 2008. Yeah, right. But now, I mean, Dave and I were doing bands on the leg press, reverse band, hack squat. Like we were doing that. 12 years ago yeah and now everybody's like this is the magic exercise and um i i don't it's um it's a that's another double-edged sword because it's not doing something different because doing something different different doesn't make it better right i mean really what it boils down to is finding the exercises to work for you and figuring out what the magical intensity is that you can train at and still recover from because Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what you have to do is you have to be able to push hard enough to demand that adaptation, and then you have to give yourself enough nutrition and rest and whatever to recover from it. Yep. So you can go real hard and you can be crippled sore. That's fine if you want to wait six or seven days to train something again, or you could find a way to recover better and maybe train something in a fourth day later. So right. the common denominator there, though, is the hard work. Like you have to find a way to challenge your body in a way it hasn't been challenged, but then you also have to be able to recover from it. So if you have a coach that can do that with you, you know, I have these programs obviously, and I have splits, but what I tell people, like, for example, Hey, if it's Thursday and on my schedule, it says legs, but your legs don't feel recovered. Take the day off. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's a very bad idea to train a muscle that's not recovered. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what study you show me. I don't care what you say to me. That's one thing you're probably not going to change my mind on. There's a lot of things you could change my mind on potentially, but that's not one of them. I don't see a damaged muscle being trained as a viable long-term strategy. Like maybe if you want a short-term super overcompensation, if you want to get in all that science, but just to generally train in a way that doesn't allow for recovery. I think that's how, in fact, I think that's how you get into a true state of overtraining. Mm -hmm. So a good coach to me is someone that can get the best out of you, the best effort, but also teach you how to recover. So anybody, anybody out there that coaches can take someone in and put them on drop sets on hack squats and whatever and get them sore. But how do you do it so that how do you put in just enough so that their body has to adapt without destroying them and then get them to recover so that potentially they're not even sore? Like if you can do that, you're a pretty good coach. 